All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me this Thursday evening. Hope you guys had a, a nice day since it was beautiful out there today. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. Today we will be covering the non-negotiables of a highly effective strength training program. Uh, before we start, do me a favor, silence any technology, cell phones, TVs, anything around you. I have a lot of good information that I want to cover with this webinar. So I want to make sure you get the most of it and you are able to uh, apply these strategies moving forward. Take a second and look on your screen. You should see a, a panel somewhere, depending if you're on the phone or computer. Uh, there is a Q&A button. So if you at any point have any questions, comment, comments, feedback, feel free to uh, drop a line in there and that will come to me directly. I uh, hope to answer those as we can get into the webinar today or definitely at the Q&A at the very end. Uh, at, at the very end of the webinar, I will be raffling off one free month in the Healthy Running Program. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we get there, but just want to make sure you know you have to be present at the end to actually enter your name. Um, so if you're interested, I definitely recommend hanging out here for, for about 45, 50 minutes or so. Um, tomorrow, I will be sending the webinar replay. This will happen and come to you at about 11 a.m. Eastern time. So by 11.10, if you do not see that in your inbox, make sure to check your spam folder. This will include the webinar replay, the winner of the raffle. So if you are that lucky, lucky winner, I want you to make sure you respond back to that so you can, you can claim the month. All right, so let's get started. What to expect from this webinar today? I want to start talking about why I created what's called the Healthy Running Program, what we'll be raffling off at the very end. Um, by no means a promotional thing there. Uh, as I cover it here, but just kind of go over some of the mistakes I've made early on and how I have arrived at these non-negotiables, this framework that I use to create the strength training programs for runners. And then we'll talk about three specific non-negotiables, um, pretty much just a framework to use to be as effective as possible with your strength training. By no means are these all the, the non-negotiables, right? There's a lot more that we can include in this list. I try to narrow it down to where I felt most runners were missing the boat. So hopefully it helps clarify things for you moving forward so you can see more success. And then we'll intermix a few uh, first-hand client stories into that. A lot of the runners that I work with, um, how, how they have fit into the mix here, just so you get some examples and in, in relate to that content a little bit better. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. As mentioned, I am a licensed athletic trainer, strength conditioning coach, and a certified what's called active release techniques provider. Um, so it's a type of soft tissue manual therapy, very effective for uh, chronic overuse injuries. Uh, currently living in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Uh, so shout out to all those of you in, in Southeast Michigan right now. I know we have a range of people on here today. I think Boston, Illinois, Nashville, Michigan, Indiana, and also Canada as well. So, um, so I appreciate you guys joining me here this evening. Um, I run what's called the Healthy Running Program. We'll talk about that here in a second. But for any runners, again, regardless of, of goals and where they are with their running, whether they're trying to get faster, move better, recover from injury, or just overall improve the longevity of their running, it's super important with a, a sport that the injury rates are so high. So to get started, I want to kind of discuss where the non-negotiables fit. Um, over the years, I... I wouldn't say I, I messed up. I could have done a better job early on, right? So 11 years right now into this professionally, when I first started uh, as an athletic trainer at a Division One college down in Miami, uh, we would, at that point, obviously, working with the sports teams directly, we would work with a lot of overuse injuries, acute injuries. What we didn't do a good job at was we would evaluate the injury specifically. We would create some kind of treatment or rehab protocol for that injury to get that person back into playing with their team, playing with their sport, regardless of where they are in season or off season. We didn't do a good job assessing the actual demands of the sport. How well, what was that athlete doing to create that injury in the first place? Let's look at their running form. Uh, I looked, worked a lot with the tennis team. Let's look at their serve, soccer team. How do they strike the ground? How do they change directions? We didn't look at the sport as much as we should have. It was more so let's react to the injury itself. And it was, it was a very reactive type process. Rather than assessing these things on the front end, how do we reduce the likelihood of injury and get ahead of things before we get into the season? It was wait for these injuries to happen and react, treat, rehab at that point. So over the years, what I've created with this healthy running program is a more proactive approach to, uh, to running, running performance, really. Um, with the injury rates of running being so high, about 75% of runners get injured each and every year. It seems like every time I do a webinar, the dog decides to get a toy out. So if you start squeaking, I apologize. Um, but wanted to take a more proactive approach to running. 
with the injury rates being so high and most runners needing to implement a strength training program and not just to, to get stronger and improve their running, but hopefully offset some of the injury risks in the process. So what I've created over the years here is a more well-rounded and all-encompassing program consisting of initial evaluation, movement assessment. How can we detect the areas that we need to address before they become problems? Or if you've had a, a series of, of previous injuries, how do we get on top of those so that they don't come back? Because it's very likely that those will recur at some point um, when it comes to running. And then also, and, and I think this is the interesting part, um, even though we're talking about strength training, running analysis really fits, uh, is, is super important in the whole kind of approach here. Because if I'm creating the best strength training, strength training program possible for a runner, but I'm not taking into consideration how do they run, I could create the best program. And it's very easily undone if you don't have good form, don't have good mechanics. So one thing that I saw early on was I was working really hard to create these programs. I was doing an evaluation and assessment, but not an analysis. And just in months into it, I'd hear, hey, my knee hurts, my ankle hurts, my shin. Um, like, I don't know what's going on when we have you on a great program, you're getting stronger, we're addressing your weak links, um, but we didn't understand that they were overstriding. They were losing stability at the pelvis, their foot was overpronating, their cadence, we need to work on increasing cadence and addressing some of these things. So now, addressing all of those things and looking at all those little pieces in the process and using these non-negotiables, which I'll talk about in a second, really creates this, this bigger framework that we can then create a more individualized strength and running retraining program. So we need to make sure we're looking at all of these pieces rather than one or the other, or just doing exercises to do exercises, right? What I often tell people is general strategies will get general results. Um, so we need to make sure we individualize that as much as we can and use these strategies and non-negotiables that we'll talk about today, how to input those into a system. So regardless of where you are, and if we think about this almost like a street light, um, regardless of where you are, the non-negotiables that we cover today will be helpful. Again, it doesn't matter where, whether you're currently not running, experiencing some kind of pain, or you were experiencing pain, you're finally back to running, but you're still not 100%, or you're pushing for some kind of performance goals. Um, these non-negotiables will fit regardless of where you are along the spectrum. Um, so it's, maybe, it's good to understand that uh, they're very applicable regardless of the situation. And I tend to look at strength training, rehabilitation, all of that is the same thing. It just depends on where you are along this continuum, right? Rehab is just strength training when you're in pain, addressing those key areas, weak links, probably some kind of manual therapy, other modalities mixed into that. And then Strength training is as we start to formally get past that maintenance mode, performance mode. That's where most people think of strength training, but it really fits along the spectrum. Exercise, addressing weak links, becoming better as runners. Now, as we get into the content here, first thing we're going to cover, our first non-negotiable is specificity. So those of you who have watched my webinars in the past, I usually, at some point, only for about three minutes or so, uh, talk about some of the key principles that should guide the rest of the webinar. This webinar will be specifically on those key principles, right? So this is kind of like that overlying 36,000 foot view, right? You're driving over, we're not necessarily on street level, we're drive, we're flying over the city, looking down at the general layout of the city, rather than on the street, thinking about those tactics and exercises. Because if you understand these things, these non-negotiables, you'll be able to input the best exercises and drills to help you specifically. And we'll talk about specificity here. So. First thing we need to ask ourselves is what story does our body, was our body or your body tell you, right? We all have a unique history. Uh, we have a unique anatomy, unique biomechanics, injury history. What key things do we need to address that fit our situation specifically? Biggest problem, like I mentioned a second ago, people applying general exercises and hoping for specific results, right? It doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. We need to make sure what we're incorporating in terms of a strength training program is as specific as possible to our needs. Um, that's why I didn't want to go in here and say, here, runners, can you do step ups, lunges, split squats? Yeah, we all know that, right? But, but which one is more specific to our needs? And that's something we need to try to figure out. So some of the things I want you to take in consideration here when it comes to strength training, and, and, and these are all the different areas that I like to look at in that initial evaluation and assessment phase when I first meet a runner, is first and foremost, previous injury, injury history. We know that a past injury has a really good chance of becoming a future injury, right? A lot of people get to the point with their rehab process, they finish PT, they're, they're now pain-free and they move on, right? Unfortunately, a lot of those things tend to come back down the road. So you need to make sure physical therapy, 
uh, that type of rehab and exercise is your first step. And then as you get past that, you're figuring out how to layer on more strength, more stability, more power, uh, address the weak links because it's typically not uh, completely resolved within a, within a few months. Uh, range of motion is something that's important. From a running standpoint, there are a few joints and, and ranges of motion that are the most important. This is the great toe, the ankle, and the hip. Um, we don't need to spend a lot of time in terms of range of motion, but need to, need to see really, are there any big differences from side to side? There's a few runners that I've been working with recently that have asymmetries, as we'll call them. There's our differences in range of motion from side to side. And what that does create is, is, is just different in movement, right? Different movements. So they're, as they lower down into a squat, you can see them shift. We're starting to see little different, different positions in the pelvis. So we need to clear up these differences from side to side to make sure we're as symmetrical as possible, even though we're very asymmetrical as you look in our, in our internal anatomy, but doing a good job to address these things specifically. And then degree of power, strength, and endurance. Okay? If we're gonna implement a strength training program, it's pretty important to know what your baseline is, right? What are we trying to improve? What are our weak links? What areas are we above average? Are we average or below average, right? Uh, I've had a handful of people lately that could hold a stationary lunge for two minutes, but then we put them into a side plank position, 20 seconds, right? It's like, okay, we need to really prioritize core strength and core stability. Their leg endurance is great, um, but it starts to really allow you to understand what are those priorities in terms of your strength training program to be as specific as you can. Stability and balance, another key area that a lot of runners are, are missing and neglecting within their program. Uh, want to make sure you're as stable and balanced as you can on a single leg. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. I, wanna, I don't wanna give it away. Movement competency is just overall quality of your movement. How well do you move? So yes, we wanna be better at runners, but we have kind of a, a foundational library of, of movements that we wanna be proficient at. Your squat, your lunge, your push up. Um, I mean, a lot of your, your step up. There are a lot of things for reach or, or, or toe touch, little things that uh, are movement patterns that will help translate to better running performance. That's what we often look at in the strength training world is, is can we overall improve quality of these movements and then bridge the gap so we can translate those into better running performance. And then lastly, like I mentioned a little while ago, talking about the healthy running program, running mechanics. Um, this needs to be a part of your, your program, right? Where are you breaking down as you run, right? There's no perfect running form. So I'm not here, gonna, here telling you, hey, your cadence needs to be 180. You need to lean forward. You need to strike with a, a midfoot strike pattern. None of that. I don't think any of that matters, right? It really depends on you as an individual, your injury history, and your goals. But how do we intertwine or improve running mechanics throughout this strength training process? Because if we're getting stronger, but that's all it is, is getting stronger, is it necessarily gonna help anything in terms of our running? A little bit, but not really, right? It might make us more resilient to injury, it might make us less likely to fatigue later in a race, help maintain posture, those things, it's definitely still effective, but we need to make sure we're combining all of these aspects that are positively impacting running mechanics as well in the process. Now, you need to ask yourself a little bit more specifically, what's the outcome you want to achieve, right? Uh, a lot of people are jumping into strength training programs saying, I want to get stronger. Is that necessarily the end goal? What is that going to translate to in the end? What is that specific goal you're trying to achieve? We need to think a little bit more closely about running itself, right? When we're creating these programs to be specific. So understanding the demands of running. Running is a very single leg plyometric like activity. Okay, so right there, we know we're literally bounding from one leg to the next on a single leg, right? There's no instance where two feet are on the ground at the same time. So that should already kind of shift your focus. Like, okay, I understand plyometrics are important. Single leg exercises are important, right? It starts to narrow our focus. Do we still do squat? Do we still do leg press? Of course, right? We want a nice well-rounded program, but you need to prioritize specific things based on uh, your weak links and your end goal. Um, because running is a very predictable movement pattern, that's a good thing and a bad thing. Right, so it's predictable. We know that um, specific ranges of motion, specific joints, specific muscles, uh, amount of force. Uh, we know specifically within our strength tra training program the things we need to improve or target to become better runners. Right, and I often see a kind of a disconnect here. It's okay. We understand that we're bounding from one leg to the other, but I'm going to complete a leg extension, sitting down, extending leg. Okay, great to isolate the quad. Maybe you have a past knee injury 
or you have a, a deficit in quad strength, but how is that going to fit into this predictable movement pattern? Just because the muscle is stronger doesn't mean it's going to function better in a movement pattern like running. The forces of running two to six times your body weight, I make sure to remember that. Um, a lot of impact coming down on that leg, and they said actually the internal forces, the, the, the total force of hitting the ground and all of the muscles contracting is actually much, much higher than that. So we need to make sure bones, muscles, tissues, joints, all of these, um, these tissues have the, the strength and the resiliency to withstand the demands of running. Um, and then obviously power, strength, endurance, stability, balance, all of that needs to happen at the same time while withstanding these repetitive loads. So as you think about your strength training program, I would think, okay, what, am I, what do I have in my program right now? Does it fit within these parameters? Am I directly targeting the specific demands of running or am I missing the boat, right? Now, Lily Tallman said, I always wanted to be somebody, but now I realize I should have been more specific, right? So you have the opportunity here with your strength training program to be whoever you want to be right? Only thing that's, that's standing in your way is, is following the right program, patience and consistency. That's all it really comes down to. Uh, I've been working with a lot of runners recently in a, in a six-week program. Um, and obviously, six weeks is kind of that bare minimum time to start seeing some results. But it, one thing I reward is actually consistency. Are we completing the assigned exercises? Every week, they get a point total. Because I know if I'm rewarding them from doing their exercises at the end of the six weeks, it's, it's a no-brainer. They're going to get better. They're going to get stronger. They're going to get faster. They're going to feel more mobile because they're doing their exercises. So you can get to decide here, what, what are you trying to get to? What is that end result? And then making sure you're aligning that trajectory as much as possible. Now, let's take a second and talk about Vivian. So Vivian's one of my favorite clients. And you'll notice I'm going to say that about every single client I work with here today because it's true. But I started working with Vivian in March 2019. So her goals were to increase bone density. She was borderline osteopenia osteoporosis and something we, we commonly see with runners and especially female runners as they tend to age. Um, bone density is, is a huge area that most aren't thinking about enough of, uh, thinking about muscle strength because we're, we're losing or losing about a percent of muscle mass per year. We're also losing bone mass and bone density as well. Her other goal was long-term injury prevention. So she has a history of a few different injuries at the glute and hip, lower leg, like shin splint, post hip tendinopathy, and knee as well. So I wanted to make sure as she continues to run, um, again, hopefully do better, continue to run marathons, half marathons, and a lot of events down in Tennessee where she lives, um, she can just do the best she can and, and kind of have a, a strength training program that that covers all the bases to try to hopefully reduce the likelihood of injury. When we looked at her program during just our initial success session, um, we saw she just looked at her exercises. She was using a squat machine, hamstring curl, doing some arm exercises with the machine specifically, and then pull-ups and planks, which are great. But if we think, obviously, go back to the demands of running, we want her to be upright, loaded, working on stability and balance and being able to absorb force. You're not necessarily going to get that as much on the squat machine or the hamstring curl, right? So we knew right away we needed to change her program in some way. These are still great exercises. There's no such thing as a bad exercise, but we need to start to shift her focus just a little bit um, to make sure she better achieves her goals. And when it comes to bone density specifically, the squat machine is actually a great exercise for that. Um, but bones respond to variable loads, intermittent variable loads. So we can't just stress the bone the same way over and over again. That's why running is a very net neutral sport or activity for bone building, surprising to a lot of people, because you're doing the same thing over and over again. There's not much variability. And I think about basketball, soccer, changing direction, stopping, decelerating, accelerating, cutting, pivoting, all that kind of stuff. Great for bone building. So what we needed to do for her was start to implement more upright loaded movements single leg stability movements, your step ups, your lunges, and then add a plyometric component, right? So teach her how to jump and land and stabilize, but not just do that up and down or forward. We're trying to teach her to move in multiple planes of motion. So maybe around a four square, maybe in diagonals, right? There are a lot of different things that we can introduce here that help build bone density. Um, and then obviously from a long-term injury prevention standpoint, we really need to do a good job getting past these physical therapy exercises. That's one of the most common things I see with runners right now. Um, doing physical therapy exercises and kind of settling with, hey, I'm doing these still to maintain, to prevent these things from coming back. At a certain point, you need to progress those exercises. We need to move on. We need to add more resistance. We need to add more load. We need to progress those in some way to make them more challenging um, because the, these are the people from a, 
uh, fitting along the spectrum there, like I showed, about, showed you earlier, red, yellow, green, that are kind of consistently in that yellow area, but often dip back to the red. It's this continuous cycle of never truly getting forward into the green um, if you don't progress those PT exercises in some way. So that's kind of just an idea of what we did for her program uh, over the last about year, I guess it's been a year and nine months or so now, which has been awesome. Now, feel free, if you guys have any questions at all, drop those questions in the Q&A as we go. You'll know I do speak a little bit fast. And I apologize. <laughs> Probably a boss, the Boston thing in me, even though the accent has been, been lost over the years. But non-negotiable number two, we're going to talk about variability. So variability, we're going to kind of break down in two separate ways. We're going to look at periodization, which is a way to add more variability to your running strength training program, and then also movement variability. Okay? And we'll discuss those in greater detail here in a second. So periodization, I'm just going to read through this. Periodization is the systematic planning of athletic or physical training. The aim is to reach the best possible performance in the most important competition of the year. It involves progressive cycling of various aspects of a training program during a specific protocol or specific period, sorry. Um, that's from my friend at Wikipedia. So periodization is super important. If we think about running programs, uh, running programs, and we want to stay away from just maintaining a set mileage, high mileage, low mileage, somewhere in the mid. We want to stay away from that uh, throughout the entire year. We start to build for our goal race. And I think a, a contrast to this definition, most runners, and I'd say what I want to kind of talk about more specifically here is two competitions for a year. So if we think of that April, we'll say April half marathon and then October half marathon, most runners have that and they have other races that are not goal races along there. Um, that's kind of what it takes to follow a periodized plan. We want to build, build, build volume, peak for that goal race come April. We can take a step back we can recover. We're still running some base mileage and then we're going to build up again for that October race, right? So this is a way that we're preventing ourselves from staying at a higher mileage throughout the year. So we can hopefully reduce or offset that, that risk of injury. Like I mentioned, again, 75% of runners get e injured each and every year. So it's important to not, um, to not stay at high mileage for too, for too long. So at least ask a good question, would trail running be better than road running for building bone density since movement is more varied? Um, yeah, most likely, I don't know if I, if I ever have seen anything on that in terms of research. I would assume so, just because if you think about terrain, usually terrain's a little bit more varied, rocks, roots, you're having to move a little bit more laterally to change directions. Um, so I would assume so, but I've never seen anything solid to, to validate that. Now, you have to respect your running while not neglecting the key strategies that allow you to achieve success and longevity within the sport. Uh, thing, what big thing we think about with, with periodization is yes, running is the priority, but we have these other strategies that we're going to cycle in. Like we mentioned, we're, we're cycling in different strategies depending on the phase where you're at with your training, making sure you're recovering, your strength training, mobility, your running retraining, all those uh, exercises and drills that translate to better running mechanics, dynamic warm-up, cool down, and then all your self-care, whether that's if you like the foam rolling and self fascial release, trigger point guns, um, meditation, prayer, uh, whatever it is in terms of self-care, uh, we need to make sure all of these pieces are fitting together in one cohesive program when it comes to uh, periodizing and peaking at the right time. But if we look at running, and this is very simple, I made this on Canva, so uh, kind of cut me a little bit of slack here. But just to show you, if we're peaking for a race come April or October, this is just what you'll see on just a, a basic outline of starting in January, building and running volume, peaking for that April race, taking a small step back and never, usually not stopping running, right? There's no reason to stop. Um, that's why I get, I get yelled at a lot of times if I say uh, May and June is the off season for runners or November and December is the off season. Someone always comments in and say, what are you talking about? I never stop running. Uh, and I understand that, but it's just, it's our focus starts to shift a little bit, right? We go from building to taking a step back, recovering, maintaining a base, and then building again. So we go through these different cycles throughout the year. Now, strength training, and where a lot of people go wrong, is completing the same strength training program, either completing the same running program consistently, no variability within the running, or, or keeping the same strength training program that doesn't change based on your running. Um, either you're doing too much strength training that's going to negatively affect you and your running as your running mileage picks up, your running volume, or you're not doing enough that's building in those off-season periods when we get to May and June 
for November and December where you finish your goal race and maybe you're running a couple fun 5Ks, 10Ks, or kind of just messing around. Um, so you need to make sure that these things change throughout the year. Having variability within your program can really help offset that, that injury risk of doing the same thing consistently for a long time. That's usually the issue what we see with running. So right now, like I mentioned a second ago, we're in um, again, in the sixth week actually of the, this Run Strong Challenge that I'm running. And I usually run these strategically at the certain times of the year. We wanna run this at lower mileage times. Most runners can afford to take a step back November and December after they finish that goal rate, can, can recover, can work on the strength training, can get stronger, and then prepare themselves for January, February, March as they need to start to back down the strength training, right? So this time of year can afford to do anywhere from two to four days of strength training per week. And then as you get into those, those building periods for your running, that's when you back down to one or, one or two days of strength training, right? So what that does here, if we look at these glasses, right, it's just helping us build a bigger glass. And what that means is our overall foundation. Majority of runners that aren't including any kind of strength training, I'd kind of put them in this category of the, being the smaller glass, right? Uh, it takes a certain amount of water and that glass will over, overfill, overflow. What we're trying to do with the strength training, we're trying to build a bigger, stronger, more resilient glass, right? That's we're trying to enhance our foundation so we can put more water inside of it. More water can mean anything to you, right? It could mean your pace. You're trying to PR a half marathon and go from 215 to, to two hour or under two hours, right? Okay, it could be we're pushing to a higher intensity. Maybe you're going from a half marathon to a full marathon. Strength training creates that, that kind of buffer for us to be safe with our running. So we're building a stronger and more resilient foundation so we can go ahead and express ourselves as runners, right? We don't always want to be limited like, hey, every time I, I try to run this distance or I try to run this speed, I always bump into issues, right? Using the strength training um, as a strategy to help improve our running because what we're trying to ultimately prevent which with all this we're trying to prevent that glass from overfilling right so this is the reason why as running volume picks up strength training is going to back down because there's only so much so much stress the body can handle right and then we're also hopefully big creating a bigger glass here a better foundation so we're less likely to overflow okay and that's that's when it comes this all kind of boils down which will help impact reducing your risk of injury improving performance um, and kind of running on your, your terms more so. Now, from a variability standpoint, um, we look at the differences between running and a lot of other sports, right? Running's in most every sport. Uh, but we look at, on the left side, Elliot Kipchoge, uh, again, great, great runner. Uh, but we look at just the action of running. And I, don't, I don't need to explain that to you much, but we see just that cyclical, repetitive movement pattern. Not much changes there, right? You're, you're set in, besides, I know Lisa said a second ago, like trail running, a little bit more variability in trail running. But you're usually set in, running straight ahead in that sagittal plane for uh, minutes, hours, for weeks and weeks and months and years on end. So we need to make sure from a variability standpoint, we're adding different components into our program that are gonna break us out of that sagittal plane of strictly forward running. If we compare running to tennis, for example, soccer, some of these other sports, uh, Roger Federer over here, you can see kind of lunging for the ball uh, on his backhand, moving in different planes of motion, very unpredictable sprint, decelerate, accelerate, change directions, pivot, push off, jump, land, uh, reach, and a lot of different movement patterns happening here. So the problem we see with running is lack of variability increases the overall risk of injury, right? And if we look at this article, and sorry if you guys can't see that because I'm at the top, top here, but there's an article that came out that said comparable use of different running shoes decrease running related injuries. Um, 2015, Malasu et al. And I know it seems a little weird talking about running shoes here, like a little off topic, but I swear it makes sense. What they found out was if you wear more, uh, if you have more than one running shoes, and you wear a single pair less than 58% of the time, so you have multiple pairs, maybe two or three pairs of running shoes, and you intermix those throughout the week, and they cannot be the same pair, right? So I have a, a Saucony Ride right now. I cannot have a, a new pair of Saucony Ride and an old pair. So what I use is Saucony Ride, New Balance 880s, right? I have two different running shoes that fit my needs, and I intermix those throughout the week. So what we know is by wearing different shoes, you have a 39% lower risk of suffering from a running related injury. So that alone should be something most people should try from an injury reduction standpoint. 
But what this does, because of the differences in shoes, the midsoles are, are created with different densities, different structures and materials, the geometries and the setup of the shoe, it alternates the pattern in the force that the body has to distribute as we run, right? So we're, we're placing a, a different or variable load amount of force and pattern on the foot in lower extremity. And that's what's actually offsetting our injury risk. So what this study found was that participation in other sports was protective against running related injury because it varies the load applied to the musculoskeletal system. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. So with strength training, yes, we want to be specific. We also want to have some exercises that are variable. So if most of your exercises are addressing your weak links, they're specific to running, maybe 75% of your exercises, the last 25 are going to be a little bit different, right? They're going to move you in different planes of motion. They're going to stress joints, muscles, and tendons in a, in a way that you're not currently loading while running. Because the, what they found was multiple shoe use and participation in other sports are strategies potential, potentially leading to, and this is the key here, variation of the load applied to the musculoskeletal system. So this could be advised to recreational runners to prevent running-related injuries. So yeah, we don't – great to run, use, play different sports – great to wear more than one pair of shoes, but we can accomplish all of the same stuff in our strength training program, moving in different range of motions, jumping and laterally, jump and land side to side, jump and land at diagonals, lateral lines versus forward lines. Like those little changes to your program could help be, it really pay off big time from an injury reduction standpoint. Okay. That's why variability is important. Now, if we look at here, the difference between variability Specificity and variability. Specificity would be something like this marching drill. Doesn't get more specific than that from a strength training standpoint for runners, right? We're, we're marching, balance, stability, striking down, single leg stance, core, posture, everything is working together to stabilize the body. On the other hand, we have a lateral lunge here. Never move in this way as we run, right? We never move laterally. We never load that deep into the, into the knee and the hip. Okay, so we're, we're placing a different stress on the kinetic chain, vary the loads in the body, different range of motion, different force, and a different plane of motion um, to hopefully offset that risk of injury, right? So these are some of the key things that need to be uh, play a part in your strength training program, specific, and then also have some of that variability piece in there. All right, guys, so now as we get to number three, one of the most important ones that is almost always neglected, I feel like, when it comes to running, and this is, saying it right now, it doesn't make sense, but it has to make you a better runner, right? If you're going to implement a strength training program, it needs to translate over to the end result. So we need specific things in there that are going to actually make you a better, more efficient, more economical runner in the process, right? Do we want to be strong just to be strong? That's great. Yeah, we probably want that to some degree, especially as we age. But if our job is to get faster, run longer, reduce the chance of injury, recover from injury, we better make sure we're expressing those things as we run as well. Now, if we look here, look at the differences, right? So it has to make, if, it, if we wanted to make us a better runner, what is our exercise selection going to look like? Great exercise on the left side, we have leg press, right? We can build strength, we can load the long bones of the tibia and femur, uh, but we're in a supported position on our back, right? I hope you're not running. I hope you're not running in that position ever. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't go too well. But making simple tweaks to our program that will translate over, like going from this leg press to an upright squat. Now we're working on shifting back into the hips, stabilizing, connecting the foot into the ground so we have more of this instability component posture, stability, all of these things have to work together. So thinking about the current program you're, you're doing right now or that you want to do, and then thinking about the exercise selection is super important because we want to be in positions that will better translate. And then if we look at core exercises here, um, crunches, sit-ups, those things can never an instance where we're going into that position, that forward flex position at the spine. Not saying don't do it. I still give uh, usually straight leg sit-ups or uh, toe touches. I give a handful of crunching movements to my clients. I mean, they probably have one in their program, I would say. But doing other exercises like on the right side here, dead bug with stability ball, right? So this exercise is working on core stability, engaging the muscles around the core, not moving into flexion extension because we don't move into those positions as we run, getting all those muscles to stabilize the pelvis, the spine, and the rib cage to hold that in a rigid position as we're moving opposite arm and opposite leg. So we think they're running opposite arm, opposite leg, very specific 
movement pattern, right? So we need to start thinking about how are we going to get these things translate over to the sport of running, going back to that specificity principle earlier as well. But key thing to talk about here is this research article it's from 2015, I believe. Um, Rich Willie, Irene Davis, and some of the best researchers when it comes to runners, runner, running injuries, running performance, strength training programs, and all of that. Um, they did a six-week study, the effect of a hip strengthening program on mechanics during running and during single leg stance. So what they did, they found 20 female runners that displayed what's called hip adduction, right? So as they ran, they're either their knee collapsed in or their, their foot landed too far under their body that their, their leg was at an angle like this, right? If we think of normal alignment, our hips and our legs are vertical like this. We never run in that position. We're usually in a little bit, but these women were in excessively, right? Their leg or their knee was collapsing too far underneath their body. So that's a risk factor for injury. What they found after running them through a six week strength training program. So they did all your, your traditional exercises. They did, you can see some single leg stance, some mini squats. They've done your clamshells, your hip activation exercises. Um, on the right side, it's kind of like a single leg stance with the, it's called reactive neuromuscular training. He's trying to pull her knee in as she's correcting and driving into the band. After a six week period of time of doing all these exercises, they found that these, the women, their the runners, their strength increased significantly, right? They were so much stronger on the hip abductors and the hip external rotators. But when they actually retested their running and put them on the treadmill to look at a running analysis, there was no change to their hip or knee mechanics. So I think that's something we really need to think about is, I'm trying to move this here. There we go. So one thing we need to think about is, are the exercises we're incorporating in our strength training program actually making us better runners? From this article alone, and there's been a couple, other to, a couple others to actually uh, kind of back this up, we need to bridge the gap a little bit better. And that's where the whole running retraining piece comes in. If we want to be better runners, strength training is a piece of that to address the risk factors, to get a stronger, more resilient, uh, to build power, to help us get faster, potentially. But if we're looking from a running mechanics, running economy standpoint, efficiency standpoint, we need to do specific drills and exercises that are going to make us actually better once we get out there on the road. So this article suggests that strengthening alone may not be adequate to alter the underlying abnormal movement patterns uh, of running. Uh, fine. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's applicable to everyone. I have some runners that come in to say, hey, um, I want to look at running form. I want to get on a strength training program. And we look at them and it's like, man, you run great, right? There's, there's no risk factors. You don't have really a, a history of injury. Let's work on that strength training piece. There might be a few key things we work on, cadence or what have you. But um, other runners that, and I think this is where I ran into trouble early on in my career, when we create strength training pro programs for runners, and after a month or two months, I'd come in and be like, man, my knee is just bugging me as I build up mileage here. Because we were creating programs that weren't addressing the underlying abnormal movement patterns of running. They were overstriding. Their foot was overpronating. They were dropping at the pelvis. They were in a bad position in terms of spine, pelvis, rib cage positioning, right? So we weren't addressing actually how they ran. So when it comes to strength training, I think it's important to look at all of these pieces together. Yes, it's, it's good to get stronger, to be more stable. That's the first step. But if you truly want to become a better runner, you need to find a way to really allow your strength training your exercises and your drills to translate to your running, okay? So how do you do that? You do a running analysis, right? You need to look at your running. And it's something I always I recommend most runners invest in. Majority are uh, messaging me a lot and saying, here, what are, the, what are the exercises? What are the best exercises I should be doing to help my running? It's like, I, I really have no idea. I mean, most likely step ups, split squats, lunges, maybe some bridges or planks. I mean, I don't know. It really depends on the runner, your goals, and, and what your needs are. Right. So unless we're identifying these things, there's a, is, there is still always the chance if you're incorporating a strength training program that you could be missing the boat. Okay. Cause we want that stuff to translate over to better running mechanics. So looking at that, doing an initial running analysis, doing a follow-up running analysis. Usually I do those quarterly. So about, uh, about three months apart, because that's the time period we need to actually start seeing some results in terms of running form. Things are not quick. Um, majority of runners, I tell them, Hey, expect about six months to, to, to be in a much better place. So it takes a, a good amount of time to start to impact overall morning mechanics. Now, looking at a couple clients here, this is Jen, another one of my favorite, uh, favorite clients. Been working with Jen just over a year now, actually a year and one month. I think it was November last year. Um, so this is one of the things, 
and, and wasn't necessarily something that I brought up to her like we need to address. She didn't have an injury history of any kind of foot, uh, post-tib, calf, knee issue from overpronating as we see on this left side. It was something that I just knew we needed to correct in the process. So we really hit heavily on a lot of single leg stability work. We talked about cadence when it comes to running analysis to land in a better position. Usually for increasing your cadence, you can land a little bit wider and you can pull that stride in. So not over striding, which would cause a greater degree of, of pronation there. Um, what we see here from her program, you can see the difference from left to right. Uh, much better in controlling her foot. Obviously, we still have some work to do if we look at position of the pelvis. This is our, our prime focus right now with her part of her strength training program. She's doing all the things. She's doing full body, upper body, lower body, core, getting stronger, more powerful, jumping, landing, different directions, working super hard right now for next year. Um, but one of our focuses right now is now foot looks great, stabilizing down there well when I continue to do single leg work, but can we work on positioning of the pelvis? Okay, so now doing some specific exercise in the lunge and split stance positions, a lot of single leg focus, but her really focusing on, can I maintain that stability and that alignment throughout there, All right? It's always a work in progress. It's always something to work on. Now, this is Megan. Uh, Megan's awesome. We're in work with Megan about five, six months now. Um, first started with her virtually. She was actually in upstate New York and she moved here to Southeast Michigan. Her boyfriend lives here. But we look at her position. She has a history of some injuries. She was a former collegiate runner. Uh, IC band syndrome, recently a high hamstring tendinopathy, a couple little things that uh, kind of consistently kind of come back and rear their head. So we're working together to see what we can do in terms of, uh, of strength training, how, how can we connect those weak links, and then what things do we need to address from our running standpoint, because we want to make sure we're not neglecting those in the process and getting stronger just to get stronger, but not actually getting anywhere in the end. So you can see on the left side of the screen, we've kind of identified early on that just the position of her of her trunk. She was in a very tall position, actually overextended, so we could see a little bit of rib cage flare as she ran into some of the movements that we tested her on. So we knew early on we needed to try to correct her position. Instead of telling her, hey, I want you to lean forward, we worked on within a strength training program, breathing first and foremost. I think one thing a lot of runners are neglecting, and something it might sound crazy, but uh, I, I put that into the strength training bucket as well. Proper breathing, because breathing translates to core stability. If we can hold the pelvis, uh, the pelvis, the spine, and the rib cage in a good canister alignment. You can see below there, I see better canister formation. If we can maintain a good position of the canister, which is typically why I don't do a lot of crunches and those types of movement for runners, it's a lot of stability work. So we want to create that canister that we can then create mobility, stability, and power off of a solid midsection. Um, we can then take that next step and work on developing a small small trunk clean. So we worked on the breathing and the stability work first, really getting the core in a better position. And then from there, teaching that trunk clean, right? So it's a, just a sequential process over the last, geez, I think it's been five, must've been five months or so at this point, but you can just see the difference in position there overall. Now, again, not necessarily strength exercises, but like I mentioned, things we need to connect our strength training with our running. So it's great to be doing your lunges, your split squats, your squats, your push-ups, your planks, your bridges, and all those motions. Um, but are there specific things in terms of running form we need to tease out? So this is a buddy in Nashville, a uh, physical therapist that I worked a lot with while I was in Nashville, Chris Wolf. And just, we did a lot of, uh, lot of offerings for runners while we were down this. We created tons of videos together, some with him, some with me. Um, so that's why he's in this one right here. But you can see this is a, if we're working on it, I have a lot of runners that have trouble either controlling their pelvis getting the hip into extension to properly push off, maybe have some hip flexor tightness. These are all the things that we put into play within the strength training program. How do we get more flexibility in the hip flexors, get mobile into hip extension so we can actually push off and express that? Um, and then how do we isolate that to teach that hip extension rather than just assuming, hey, if I stretch my hip flexors, I'm going to uh, be able to extend my hip better. We, we see through the research that's just not how it works. So doing isolated drills that help retrain those specific weaknesses in terms of running form. Marching, if you're someone that works with me, most likely you're doing marching probably on a weekly basis, right? To the point where it drives you crazy. So marching is one of the most specific things you can do to help your running. Um, not necessarily just marching in a general way, but there are certain things that we'd wanna think about as we run. So some people that run and their legs cross over, 
we're putting a piece of tape or a line on the floor, telling them make sure as you strike the ground, you're not crossing over that line. We're never running, in, never marching in tandem. We're going on either side. So we're developing a slightly wider step width. People that over, uh, over stride, land too far in front of the body. You can see as he comes back here, where the foot strike should happen, driving down directly underneath that knee. He's going here with the four foot strike, which fit, fits his running specifically. It doesn't really have to be a four foot strike, but these are the little pieces that we start to intertwine within strength training programs as well to, to have all the pieces really connect together. Um, obviously not strength-based exercises, but I like to think of strength training more as specific movements, exercises, and drills that translate over, right? Doesn't necessarily always mean you're lifting a heavy weight. Can you do a certain movement that makes you a better runner in the end? Um, that's kind of the goal here when it comes to strength training. So these are the things that I'll add in either as part of the dynamic warm up, as rest or recovery sets in between exercises, might be doing a heavy squat uh, core exercise and maybe doing marching for 30 seconds, let the heart rate come, come back down, work on running four runs. A lot of different ways you can start to intermix these things. But as we see from the research, we need to do a better job of allowing our strength training and our running to merge together. And that's filling in the blanks here with some of these, some of these drills. All right, guys, so I want to ask, I want to run through a quick quiz here. Depending on where you are on your phone or you are on the computer, you may or may not see this. So full disclosure right now, um, I just want to see how well you guys have been paying attention over the last, as the dog whines at me here, over the last 45 minutes or so. Um, so just the best you can do here on these three questions. Number one, while running, your body can experience anywhere, anywhere up to how many times your body weight and ground reaction forces, two, three, four, or six. That's times your body weight. Two, periodization is a systematic planning of athletic or physical training that involves progressive cycling of a training program during a specific, I think there should be more of that, during a specific phase or period of time, I think it should say. Um, three, what factors can reduce your likelihood of injury? Choose up to three on number three. There are three correct answers on that one. Is it running more miles without properly recovering? Wearing more than one pair of shoe? applying variable loads to the body, participating in multiple sports. Okay, I'm going to wait till about 80% of people finish this. We're, we're getting up there quickly right now, 56. Getting up there fast. Some people thinking about it right now. Let's see. 60%, 63, 66. I'm going to take another about 15, 20 seconds, and we're going to start to wrap up here. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in. The dog's starting to yell at me back there, ready for her walk. 80%. I'm going to let one more. 86. Nice. We didn't lose too many people to dinner or uh, just falling asleep with their head on the computer. So that's a good sign tonight. All right. 86%. Let's stop it right there. Perfect. All right, so just to go through here, while running, your body can experience anywhere up to how many times your body weight? It's two to six times, so up to six times is that correct answer. Periodization, systematic planning of athletic or physical training, progressive uh, cycling of a training program during a specific phase, or I'm trying to think of what I try to write in there, it's true. And last one, what factors can reduce your likelihood of injury? Wearing more than one pair of shoes, that should be something you definitely consider. Applying variable loads to the moving, moving in multiple planes of motion, and then participating in multiple, multiple sports. So and mostly everyone got that. No one picked that first one, which is great. All right, guys. So let's move on here. Now, my goal with this webinar tonight, everyone always asks me, tell me the best exercises. I have no clue. If you see the people who complete my recent uh, Run Strong Challenge with 17 people in that, um, and they shared, I think week four shared the exercises, their favorite exercise and their most challenging exercise. Almost everyone had a different exercise, right? Programs are so specific and individualized to the person that I have a hard time giving people here, do these exercises. I've done that in the past and you're welcome to check out my Facebook, check out my YouTube channel or my website. Um, there'll be specific exercises on there. But I think this is where most people need to spend or, or focus down a little bit more. How can you apply these principles of specificity to your needs and to the demands of the sport, add a slight variability component in there, and then also allow your strength training to fully translate to running by bridging that gap between the strength work, running retraining to running, right? So hopefully tonight I uh, taught you how to fish rather than gave you a fish which would only, uh, only feed you for dinner tonight. Now, we're gonna enter the raffle here. So for those of you still hanging out here, um, 
raffle. Like I already almost explained the, the healthy running program early on, but those of you that missed it, uh, if you win the raffle, we'll get a running, it doesn't matter where you live, either local or remote. Running analysis will help you identify your weak links with the whole movement assessment, really break everything down, and then help you create, based on your goals and your needs, a one-month running retraining and strength training program. Obviously, it doesn't matter what it is, right? What your goals are, whether it's to recover from injury, you're struggling with something, um, prevent the likelihood of injury, or just some type of performance goal. Uh, whatever it is, we'll, we'll help you throughout that process. So we're gonna put another poll on the screen. All I need to know here, yes or no. Are you interested in entering the raffle for one month in the Healthy Running Program? Yes, no. If you're a current client, uh, enter your name as well. I, I enter every single person that votes, that adds into this or, or puts their name in this, regardless of when they're working with right now, I'll give you a free month. If you're new, you'll get a free month. So making sure I just help out as many people as possible here, and especially this time of year. It's been a crazy year. Looking forward to 2021, so hopefully – um, it will, it will be a great, a great year moving forward. I'm optimistic. Okay, we're going to wait another 10 seconds here as we start to wrap up. Any questions, feel free to start adding them in the Q&A. Let's talk about them. And we're going to wait five seconds. I appreciate you guys hanging out here this long. Hope we didn't take up too much of your time. All right, let's wrap up here. Okay, so... As an add-on to the webinars, one thing I'm gonna start adding in here is what I call a customization call. This webinar, especially a, a lot of people, I feel like going over these bigger strategies but not sure where to go from there. Um, what I wanna do with the customization call is a 30 minute call. What questions do you have? Let's talk about your goals, your running history, your injury history. What questions do you have overall that I can help put you in a better pathway. If there's a program specifically that I have that will help you, I'll tell you about it. But my goal is to just give you more value from these webinars. So spend some time talking one-on-one -on -one about these strategies. I'm going right now. So you can see there's a link up there. I'm going to also, I think you should get this. Hopefully you get a, a, a message in the chat right now. There's a link to schedule your call. So again, free call is completely complimentary but want to help you as much as possible, apply these strategies in a more specific way. And I think being able to hear more about you, your goals, running history, whatever goals you have coming up for, for April, hopefully some big, some big goals for 2021, as we all should have uh, getting out of 2020. I want to help as best I can. So make sure you schedule that call. I have limited spots available, I'm not going to, and at a certain point I need to close that down just because a lot of other clients I need to get wrapped up here before the holidays. So time is limited. But make sure as you go on there, you'll see two options. Welcome to schedule via phone. If you want to make it a phone call, a Zoom call. Highly recommend making it Zoom. If we want to test something as we're in that, like, hey, I'm, I'm having trouble here with my, my shin. Okay, let's actually, I'll show you how to test the ankle. Let's test the calf. We'll do those things together. Um, so that's kind of an idea of those, of that customization call. But make sure you schedule that. Okay, so I appreciate you guys hanging out with me here for 52 minutes. Uh, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time, you will receive the webinar replay, the winner of the raffle. If you're the raffle winner, check that and get back to me. Uh, if I don't hear from you in two days, I do move on to the next person. So check your emails, look in your spam folder, don't miss that. Um, and then if, you, if at that point you still haven't scheduled that customization call, make sure you do that so we can help you take action moving forward and connect all the dots together. Questions, questions. So Tammy, I apologize. The poll didn't show up for you. Uh, so good question. <laughs> if, if, uh, and Tammy's one of my other favorite people, if someone is currently running with no pain and no past injuries, should they do strength training of some sort? Uh, if they have time, yes. I think if we look at the normal, I hate to say it this way, the normal decline of, uh, of us as we age, we're losing muscle mass, we're, mo we're losing bone density. Typically, if you're only running, you need to do something else to offset that because we're not going to get those, those gains in muscle mass, those gains in bone mineral density. Um, so I think from a longevity standpoint, just in life, strength training, in my opinion, should fit alongside your running. Uh, does that mean you have to? No. Uh, it really depends on your past history as well. So I have a lot of runners that or know a lot of runners, so I obviously don't work with them much. I probably told them, hey, you, you don't need this, but played a lot of sports growing up, basketball, soccer, uh, jumping, landing. I think they have a good foundation in place and they're running now and haven't seen many issues. Um, 
I, there's always something to correct most likely, but I usually tell them you, you probably need to do as, as, as little as necessary a day a week, maybe a couple of corrective exercises. There's still some benefit in that, but um, not, it's not as necessary as for someone without an injury history and without bigger performance goals. So if you want to run faster, stronger, longer, strength training, you need to do it. Or if you need to uh, and make sure these injuries don't come back, strength training as well should, should play a role there. So question here, um, Lisa and Jennifer in the, in the registration had a similar questions. So Jennifer said, strength training to protect my knees. And Lisa, what could help a runner who has arthritis in knees, has had meniscus surgery and wants to minimize future injury? Um, so when it comes to the knees specifically, strength training is, is huge, but you need to do the right exercises. I find people, especially with arthritis or history of knee pain, you need to be cautious of the positions you're getting into. Usually stability is a huge uh, component that's, that's missed. It's not just building up strength of the quad. It's stabilizing the foot, the hip, the pelvis, because that knee is almost stuck in the middle. That's really influenced by those other joints. Um, and then just loading in a, in, a, in a safe and progressive way, loading over time. I know funny, Tammy was just commenting here. Tammy's someone who, who had knee arthritis, has knee arthritis, and we work together now last five months or so. But slow, progressive you know, changes to the program, finding the right positions that are pain-free, slowly getting into more challenging positions, progressing to more single leg movements, but finding out how we can balance the kinetic chain, glute, hamstring exercises, core, pelvic control, all of those other areas really um, matter quite a bit when it comes to the knees, okay? And then obviously thinking about cadence as well, where that foot is striking. We talked a lot about cadence last webinar, a couple webinars ago, making sure we're not overstriding specifically will really overload the knees, okay? Uh, Bob, how to incorporate strength training and make it stick? I think the biggest thing is just understanding, starting simple. A lot of people, I think, go in a little bit too aggressively and can't maintain that long term. Um, start simple, one to two days per week. Understand as your mileage picks up, drop back down to a single day. Make it something really digestible that you can do long term. Uh, it's never bad to do strength training. Never bad to do strength training. If you're not completing a strength training program for an extended period of time, I would say minimum three months. Um, I would try to rethink, okay, what are my goals here? Is there anything else that I know I can do longer that's going to give me better or you're going to provide me some results, okay? Because it takes some time. It takes a minimum of six weeks to actually build strength. Anything before that is more neuromuscular. And then as we start to build strength, progress the exercises, it just, it just takes time to, for these things to trickle into your running. So consistency over a, layer, a long period of time, following a schedule, um, and not overloading yourself. Again, we don't want to make it hard just to make it hard. We want to become better runners in the process, so it doesn't necessarily mean the hardest exercises. A handful of those things will be pretty tough, but we need to be smart about it, right? We need to make sure it translates to our end goal. Uh, Kevin had a great question. Kevin says, effective weight training to counteract the effects of long-term sagittal plane running. That was nicely put. Uh, very well-educated uh, question there, Kevin. Hope you're doing well. Um, so like we talked about earlier with the variability, moving in multiple planes of motion. Uh, I would definitely say exercises like your lateral lunge or people do lunge matrix, uh, lateral, lateral step ups, lateral squats, um, jumping and landing. I like to have a lot of people do lateral jumping as well, teaching how do we jump side to side to really drive, push up from the hip that really loads that, that lateral hip, femoral neck and, and hip joint. Because uh, that's an area we tend to stress quite a bit with running. Jump, land, absorb to really bend and stabilize into the leg. Um, so just going from one foot to the other, hold for a second or two, and then jumping back to the other side. Or, I mean, those are the, the key things that I usually recommend. It really depends on the person. A lot of times with runners, what I find is st uh, flexibility outside of that sagittal plane. So a lot of runners become tight and restricted. So we're actually working on things like hip rotation with your pigeon stretch or pigeon pose. We're working on adductor rocking or groin stretches thoracic rotation we're doing mobility drills as well that's not all sagittal we're not just doing hamstring quads and hip flexors right we're doing mobility and flexibility as well uh, now that i think of it i just created a video that's uh, funny it almost sums this up perfectly just created a video on my youtube i haven't turned it into a blog yet uh, it covers specifically multi-directional uh, movement and how to get out of that sagittal plane uh, with your strength training so i think you should definitely check that out any last questions here as we wrap up?
I'm gonna take one minute or so, see if anyone has a question and then we're gonna sign off here. But I appreciate you guys joining tonight. Hope you got some value from the, from the webinar today. Again, make sure you're setting up that customization call. Now's the time to fine tune things looking into 2021. A lot of people I see, unfortunately, February and March is when my business grows significantly. People are running into issues. Hey, I have Achilles issues. I have foot issues. I have knee issues. Uh, what can I do? And uh, I almost want to get, put them in the time machine, send them, that, send them back to November before it became an issue, but we could have realized it was an issue. Um, so make sure you guys are getting on top of things now in December because it can play off, play and yeah, create big results for, for 2021. So, all right, guys, I'm going to sign off here. Um, let's see. Thank you, Tammy. Hope you have a good night. Everyone else, thank you for joining me this evening. Um, it's been a pleasure. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. If I don't speak with you, some of you, until the new year, this will be the last webinar of the year. But I appreciate you guys, and I hope you have a, a great rest of your week. Thanks again.